Uh, in this presentation, I, I will show you how the method that Max has uh, introduced in his talk can be applied for the specific study of two spatial dispersion properties, the dynamical quadrupoles and the flexoelectric tensor. I will start by briefly introducing what, uh, what this flexoelectric and dynamical quadrupole tensor are and how we can calculate them with this uh, long wave density functional perturbation theory approach. Then I will show you some numerical results uh, in the form of tests that validate our method and uh, the implementation in the Avenit software and some convergent studies. Uh, I will continue by telling something about the implementation details in the, in the Avenit software and finally I will drive the conclusions and outlook of our work. Okay, uh, at this point I don't think that there is uh, more need to introduce what is the flexoelectric effect. I just want to recall that uh, uh, whenever one tries to compute this magnitude with uh, electronic structure methodologies, there are three different contributions to the total flexoelectric tensor. Uh, the electronic one, the, lati the lattice mediated, and a third one which is a mixed electronic lattice. And today I will focus exclusively on the calculation of the clamp tie-on or electronic uh, flexoelectric tensor. Uh, to approach the calculation of this uh, magnitude, one could start by thinking that this is uh, basically the, sp the spatial dispersion of the piezoelectric tensor and one can try to compute it by taking the Q derivative of the DFPT expressions for the piezoelectric tensor. However, as Max has already mentioned, uh, this has a problem and it is that the electric field and the strain perturbations are only formulated at the zone center. And to solve this, what we have done is to redefine these uh, perturbations in the following way. For the electric field, we have uh, taken the time derivative of a vector potential perturbation and for the uh, strain uh, perturbation at finite Q, what we do is to consider the first gradient of a metric wave perturbation. With these new tools, we can actually compute the flexoelectric tensor as a second gradient of this second order energy derivative with respect to an electric field and a metric wave. And we can also take profit of the relationship between the first gradient of the metric wave, Hamiltonian and response function with the homogeneous strain in order to end up with uh, uh, equations that have more familial ob objects. Uh, so with this and together with the unconstrained uh, variational formalism that Max has presented, we reach this uh, equation that, uh, li that directly provides the uh, clamp ion flexoelectric tensor and where actually there are a lot of objects that uh, are well-known objects from the linear response theory or density functional perturbation theory and the only new three objects are these, uh, these three the, the gradient of the Coulomb kernel here we have a second gradient of the metric uh, wave Hamiltonian and here we have the gradient of the um, vector potential perturbation. Okay, this is for the flexoelectric tensor. So what about the dynamical quadrupoles? So these uh, objects formally are the second moment of the charge response to anatomic displacement. Um, this charge, charge response, uh, uh, sorry, this uh, charge response can be calculated as the cell integ integrate of the charge density response to anatomic displacement which has a lattice contribution and an electronic contribution that can be obtained again as a second order energy derivative with respect in this case to a scalar potential and to an atomic displacement. And if we do a long wave expansion of this magnitude at first order in, in Q, what we get are the Born effective charges while at second order we get what the desired uh, dynamical quadrupoles that again can be considered as a spatial dispersion property of now the Born effective charges. At this point it's worth to say that uh, this quadrupolar response is only active in, in materials uh, with uh, non-centrosymmetric atomic positions, for example in, in silicon. Okay. Uh, to calculate the quadrupoles we also have to, to do something similar as we did before, to calculate the, the second gradient of now 
a second order energy derivative with respect to the, uh, the scalar potential and the atomic displacement. And as before, we can take profit of this relationship between the gradient of the scalar potential perturbation and the electric field. And we end up with a similar set of equations as for the clamped ion flexoelectric tensor with the new thing that this magnitude needs to be symmetrized now. But again, we, we have a, a formula with uh, lots of objects that are well known. And again, we have these three new objects. Two of them are the same as the, the, the ones appearing in the previous formula. And now we, what we have here is the first gradient of the atomic displacement Hamiltonian. So why do we need to care about these dynamical quadrupoles or why, what are they useful for? Uh, first of all, uh, they can be used to, to improve the description of the long-range interatomic interactions in lattice dynamical problems that nowadays are basically described at, at the level of dipole-dipole electrostatic, electrostatic interactions. So if one has access to these uh, quadrupolar terms, one could also include, in the, for example, in the phonon uh, calculation, uh, dipole-quadrupole interactions or quadrupole-quadrupole interactions that can improve the description uh, of these uh, uh, interatomic interactions. Uh, another, uh, in another application of these uh, quadrupoles uh, is in, in electromechanic uh, couplings, which is something that was already uh, demonstrated by, Martins, by Richard Martins in 1972, where when he uh, demonstrated that the clamped ion piezoelectric tensor can be calculated as a lattice summation of the dynamical quadrupoles. Okay, with this I go for the numerical result and our test of the methodology. For the case of the uh, quadrupoles, we have studied one of the most well-known uh, ferroelectrics, lead titanite, and we have uh, he here shown the the five, fine, uh, five elements of the quadrupolar um, tensor for the five atoms in the primitive cell. And in order to, to validate this bunch of values, what we have done is, is precisely uh, use this uh, Richard Martin's formula and to calculate the clamped ion uh, piezoelectric tensor from this lattice summation of the quadrupolar moment and to compare the result of this summation with the one that we get uh, from the standard uh, calculation, uh, DFPT calculation of, of uh, strain uh, perturbation and electric field perturbation. And here, uh, this table shows the comparison between the two methods for the three linearly independent uh, elements of the clamped ion piezoelectric tensor, and you can see how we get a very good agreement mm -hmm. that uh, validates uh, the, the method and also our implementation in Avenit. Okay, for the flexoelectric tensor, we have focused only for the moment on cubic materials in which, uh, due to symmetry, there will be only three independent components for the flexoelectric tensor, which are the response to these three types of strain gradients. And we have studied uh, two different systems. One of them is a toy system made of a set of isolated noble gas atoms, and we decided to study this uh, this toy system because one can analytically demonstrate that in this system the longitudinal and the transverse uh, coefficients of the flexoelectric tensor should be the same while the shear one has to vanish. And in this table uh, I'm showing the results for three noble gases atoms and as you can see this uh, relationship is, uh, is fulfilled and also the the shear term is much smaller and it, it goes to zero if one increases the the precision of the calculation. We have also compared the, the results with uh, the ones previously calculated by my, my co-workers, basically following in this paper the method that Cyrus has presented uh, in the previous talk, and we also get a pretty good agreement with, the, with these values. We have also studied uh, real materials such as silicon or strontium titanite, and again we have benchmarked uh, our results in the first row with uh, uh, the ones obtained in the paper by, in the same paper as before, but also for the case of strontium titanite with uh, the values obtained by Max in 2014 when he was following a, a bit different approach. And as you can see, we, we get a pretty good agreement too. So this also validates the part of the, on the flexoelectric tensor calculation. 
Okay. Regarding the, the convergence of these magnitudes, here uh, I have shown the, um, for, for the case of silicon, the quadrupole uh, element and the longitudinal uh, element of the flexoelectric tensor and compare it with uh, a standard linear response magnitude such as the uh, macroscopic dielectric tensor. And uh, as you can see, uh, the main message here is that uh, these uh, spatial dispersion properties com converge uh, similarly to, uh, to, in this case, the, the, the dielectric tensor, which is uh, some good news for us because uh, it means that we don't need much higher computational effort in comparison with the standard uh, linear response magnitudes in order to obtain these uh, spatial dispersion tensors. Okay, some details about the implementation. Uh, okay, as I said at the beginning and also Max uh, has uh, mentioned, uh, the method involves to combine a lot of uh, uh, objects that are already implemented in, in Aminit, but there are few of them for which we had to introduce uh, uh, new subroutines. One of them is the, the gradient of the Coulomb kernel for which we created this new subroutine. And then we have the, the first gradient of the atomic displacement uh, perturbation uh, Hamiltonian and the second gradient of the metric wave for which we also created uh, new subroutines to, uh, to, to, to create the local potential, the kinetic contribution in the case of the metric. And we also uh, add new choices in the, all the sets of non-local potentials for, for these two cases. And finally, this, uh, this term was uh, the last one which is new, but uh, as Max has already said and it has been discussing now, it involves uh, um, the second order DDK response function, which is something that uh, is already in the code, and the response to an orbital B field that, uh, okay, we, we have just known that it's not implemented, and for the moment we haven't taken it into account in our calculations, but uh, we are safe because for the systems that we are uh, have studied uh, till now, it is expected to vanish this contribution. <coughs> so this is an example of how an input file of our calculation looks like. It's pretty similar to one of uh, the nonlinear uh, response calculation. It, uh, it is a five data set calculation that requires to compute uh, all the previous ingredients, the ground state, the DDK and the second order the DDK response functions, and then um, here we, we calculate the other response functions that are needed and in this part for the moment uh, temporarily we need to, to add this variable that deactivates some symmetries in the calculation of the response functions because our code uh, has not yet uh, been incorporated with these uh, uh, symmetries and the last uh, data set is the one that performs the long wave calculation uh, we have created a new driver to, to calculate these, uh, these properties and we have given this tentatively, uh, this tentative value for the moment. And then these uh, are all the input variables, say in the code, where the, the response functions are. No? And uh, these are the two new variables that uh, uh, activate the calculation of the quadrupolar tensor or the clamped ion flexoelectric tensor. And regarding the, the output of the calculation, we write uh, the results in Cartesian coordinates uh, as usual in the output file of Abinit. And also we write uh, um, the, the output of our calculations as third order derivatives in, the, in a DDB file. Um, for, for this, we have um, labeled a new perturbation, the DDQ perturbation, and we have given this value and number of atoms plus eight that as far as we knew uh, was not uh, assigned to any other perturbation for the moment, but this can be easily changed in any case. So uh, some details about the state of the implementation. Uh, we haven't yet asked for merging with the trunk because we want to at least have all the contributions to the total flexoelectric tensor before asking for this. Uh, and there are some, some limitations. Uh, the first one uh, is that uh, you need to calculate the response functions to all the perturbations, not only to the irreducible one. Uh, then 
we have only implemented it for LDA for the moment and just for non-conserving non uh, pseudopotentials without nonlinear core corrections. Uh, these three uh, limitations are probably work out in, in, a, in a short term. While there are other two limitations, that is that we cannot use this option for uh, the calculation as much as we can do is uh, time reversal symmetry, and that we have implemented just with uh, uh, spherical harmonics for the non-local projectors. So, okay, with this, I conclude by uh, saying that we have a new tool that is now able to compute uh, the clamped ion flexoelectric tensor and the quadrupole uh, tensor in a single Avinit run, run, that the, the, the calculation is quite fast because we don't need to, to calculate any new response function. The computational cost is similar to, to a calculation of, of linear response properties. And uh, we are already developing the next uh, ingredient for the full flexoelectric tensor. Actually, the mixed contribution is almost ready. And in the future, we plan to adapt also the method to different uh, spatial dispersion properties, such as natural optical activity or acoustical activity. With this, thank you for your attention.